Hey everybody, it's Meredith Miller with Inner Integration. And today the message I want to bring you is about overcoming the loneliness after narcissistic abuse. This is probably the biggest question that I get from people and I've addressed this several times in other videos, but it was never the title of the video. It was always something that came up around the topic. And I was trying to look through the other day to find this topic for someone who asked and I couldn't find it. So I was like, all right, let's just make a video that's specifically dedicated to this topic. So first I want to talk about the vicious cycle that we can get into around the loneliness after narcissistic abuse. And then I want to give you two antidotes to overcoming and healing that loneliness. So the vicious cycle starts in childhood, right? The childhood wound is often a sense of loneliness. For some people, it's straight up loneliness, not feeling accepted. For other people, it might be more like abandonment, but essentially the result is the same. You end up feeling lonely. If someone abandons you, you still feel lonely. So what happens is we have this childhood wound of loneliness. And then as adults, when we're unconscious of this, we end up getting into abusive relationship after abusive relationship or at the very least choosing a partner who is emotionally unavailable, right? Because that reminds us of that feeling from childhood. The wound is really a feeling and that's the feeling that's left over from the childhood experiences. So then what happens? You get into these abusive relationships. Maybe you figure it out. You leave that person Another thing that I often hear is that once people realize what narcissistic abuse is, what a narcissist is or cluster B personality, they start getting all the toxic people out of their life and they realize like they're alone. Like there's, there's no one left or maybe there's like one person left or most people end up with almost nobody for a period of time that can be quite common. And then what happens is if you don't deal with the feelings of loneliness and do the inner work, you're going to get like this craving for someone's company. And that craving is going to send you out looking for someone desperately trying to fill that void of loneliness that you feel. Like I know I've done this myself. And so then you end up getting in a worse situation and we want to stop this cycle. So what's important is to embrace the loneliness, to lean into the discomfort of the loneliness. Now, being alone and being lonely are not the same thing. Alone does not mean lonely. Alone is about physical proximity or rather the lack of physical proximity with someone else. Like you are physically alone, right? And then lonely is an emotional state. It's a feeling. It's an emotional state. So there are two different things. You can be alone and not feel lonely, or you can be with other people and feel more lonely than you do when you're actually alone. Honestly, I think that the worst kind of lonely is when you're surrounded by people, whether they're family or friends, or you're in New York City and there's millions of people around you and you feel so lonely because nobody gets you, nobody's connecting with you on any sort of deep level. So it's really important though to get the toxic people out of your life, to be willing to be alone and to face that than to continue to have toxic people around you where you continue to feel lonely even though there's family or friends or acquaintances around you. Another thing that I really recommend is to stop complaining about being lonely. I hear these complaints a lot. Sometimes I see them in the comments. Poor me, I'm all alone. What are you supposed to do if you're all alone? A lot of people did it. I did it. A lot of people did it. It might be that if you find yourself with no one else around, you're totally alone. That might be that the universe is inviting you to go deeply within, to really connect with yourself, to really get to know yourself so that you can heal that sense of loneliness and then start to attract more healthy people into your life. Complaining does not resolve the problem. It's not going to help you. And worst case scenario is you complain about how lonely you are and some predator picks that up and he's like, or she's like, oh, perfect. The perfect target. They're so lonely. They'll settle for anything and they'll come into your life pretending to be everything and then take it all away. 
So I have two antidotes to the loneliness, to the feelings of loneliness, that toxic sense of loneliness or pathological loneliness as psychologists describe it. The first one is presence. Presence means being completely here in the here and now. Presence is not distracted, dissociated, obsessing, thinking about the past, worrying about the future, ruminating over and over, wondering what somebody else is doing and what their life is like and are they doing better than you. Like you're not present in the moment if you are in the past or the future. Presence is here and now. So this is like you're in the kitchen cooking dinner and you're not thinking about the grocery list. You're not thinking about the work you still have to do tonight. You're not thinking about your kids' homework. You're not thinking about whatever you have to get done tomorrow. You're simply focusing on stirring the pot, cutting the vegetables, wrapping the chicken. Whatever you're doing, you are there in the moment focusing on that and nothing else. You are completely present in the moment. So the question that I like to ask myself when I notice I'm distracted or if I get dissociated or I start ruminating on something, the question I ask myself is, where are you? And sometimes someone else might ask you this question, like they notice you're not there, you're checked out in some way. They're like, where are you? And the answer is, I'm here. And that's what you wanna use as like a mantra to bring yourself back to present. Maybe you catch yourself distracted, you're like, oh, where was I? Oh yeah, I was obsessing about that thing from the past. I'm here and bring yourself here into the present moment. The second antidote to the toxic loneliness is authenticity. And that is being 100% you, being truly who you are. What it's not is people pleasing, becoming the person that someone else wants you to be, fulfilling their role, whatever role they've created for you in their script and their story. That's not you. You know, it's not expressing your opinions. It's choking all that down because you don't want to offend somebody and you got to walk on eggshells. You can't be in your authenticity in that kind of situation. Authenticity is you feeling free to express who you are. So the question for authenticity is who are you? And this is not your nationality, your name, your uh, religion, your race, your career. It's none of that. It's when all of that is stripped away and you're left standing in the nakedness of your being. Who are you? Brendan Burchard recommends, he calls it the identity dashboard. I've renamed it the authenticity dashboard for this particular purpose. He tells you to think of three adjectives that describe you as your ideal self. What are those three words? Think about those three words. Come up with three words for yourself. Put them on stickies, on post-it notes. Put them in your work area. Put them on your bathroom mirror. Put them in your car. Like Put them anywhere so that you keep reminding yourself during the day. Who are you? And check in with yourself. You know, and ask yourself, okay, on the scale of one to 10, how, whatever are you feeling right now? And go through those three adjectives on your list. How powerful are you feeling right now? How present are you feeling right now? How aware are you feeling right now? How vibrant are you feeling right now? Whatever your adjectives are. And that's gonna help you keep coming back to your sense of true self. So these aren't exactly the same thing. Someone I think asked about this the other day and I didn't clarify it in the comments, but I wanna make a note here. These aren't exactly the same thing. They go hand in hand, presence and authenticity, but they're not quite the same. If you think about a spy, for example, uh, a spy is trained to be completely present in the moment. Their mission depends on it, their life depends on it, everything depends on them being completely present and aware in this moment. Because when you are here and present, you're very aware of what's going on. When you're in the past, when you're in the future, when you're thinking about your shopping list or something else, you're not there and something could happen to you, right? Authenticity, the, the, the spy is not being authentic. The spy is pretending to be someone they're not. 
not. You know, fake identity, fake whatever. They're pretending to be something they're not. So they can be completely present in the moment, but also acting a part and not being completely authentic. So they're slightly different, though they do go hand in hand. And just to wrap it up, I want to put an extra emphasis on taking time out for you. I did a video on that, something like time out after narcissistic abuse. It is so important after you break up with someone or you go no contact with your family to really take time for yourself so that you can embrace that loneliness so that you can really get in there and feel the feels because if you don't feel it, you can't heal it. And all the distractions and everything else that's keeping you from really feeling that sense of loneliness or just keep going out and dating people to avoid the sense of loneliness, you're not going to get to the core of that. You're not going to get to who you really are and you're going to keep doing the repetition compulsion, attracting these people over and over again. And finally, if you find yourself alone in the world and you really don't have anyone at all and you really just you really are just dying for some sense of companionship, get an animal, get a dog, get a cat. Dogs are just unconditional love. They're incredibly loyal. They're always there. They like to snuggle. They like to keep you company. They're always attentive to you and they're just always there loving you. You know, there really is no better companion for a human being than a dog. I really believe that Venus has changed my life in so many ways. I don't know what I would have done without her when things are really, really difficult. So I highly recommend getting an animal, even, you know, if maybe you're allergic to dogs and cats, which is really sad. If that's the case, maybe get a fish you know, or get some kind of other little animal that even though you don't have such a, an, an interactive way with them as you do with like a dog, it's still another being that's there. It's someone that you can take care of in a healthy way. When you feed that fish and you clean its bowl, you know, it's a healthy form of taking care of something versus investing in the caregiving with the toxic relationship and draining yourself dry. So that's the message that I have for you today about overcoming the loneliness after narcissistic abuse. It is possible. You just have to be willing to lean into the discomfort. It's going to feel more uncomfortable at the beginning, and eventually you're just going to get more and more comfortable being alone. You're going to start to love your alone time. You get to do you in your alone time. You don't have to do what anybody else wants. You get to entirely pick your schedule and your activities and your feelings and your thoughts and everything else when you're alone. So learn to enjoy that alone time. Learn to take care of yourself. Learn to be present. Learn to be authentic. When you can do that by yourself, then you can start practicing taking that out in the world with you. It's one thing to be present and authentic when you're alone. It's a whole other challenge to do that when you're around other people. I'm sending you a big hug.